Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be oh, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We have been studying over the last number of weeks, getting to know the God we may not know. So many of us have this picture in our mind as to who God is. However, when we get into the nitty gritty of this Word of God and find out who He truly is, it certainly baffles us to think that, wow, God is so much more than what my little mind kind of pictures him as. We've gone through that God is a holy God. God is not a God who puts up with sin. God is not a God who puts up with unrighteousness. He's holy. He is righteous. He is pure. Then we found that God is a faithful God. That there's nothing he has ever said that he will not do. There's nothing he's ever said that he will not ever fulfill. It may not yet have been fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled. Why? Because he said it. Therefore, we know that it will be fulfilled. Then we went and looked and we found that God is an, an eternal God, or we looked at the eternality of God. So many people think that Jesus, for example, when he came to earth on Christmas, you know, that 2,000 years ago, that that was the creation of Jesus. That is the wrong answer. Jesus Christ always has been. In fact, if you read, for example, in John chapter 8, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he says, by the way, before your father Abraham was, I am. Of course, they could not understand that. They got all flustered. What, you're not even 50 years old? You say you were with Abraham? Yeah, I was. Because I was here before. He was even God. I was here for creation. Let us make man in our image. So I always have been, and I always will be. Last week we looked at another section, another attribute of God, another characteristic of God as to who he is. And that is the characteristic of his immutability or his unchangingness. God does not change. <coughs> Unfortunately, what's happening today in a lot of our churches and a lot of our world, in our culture, is that we think that God has to change to meet the culture. Guess what? God will not change to meet the culture. The culture had better understand that he's going to stay the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. As I was preparing for this morning, I, I was wondering, well, should I go now to the, the um, omnipotence of God? Should I go with the all-powerfulness of who God is? Or should I stay one more week on the unchanging uh, character or the personality of who God is, is. And I'm going to stay with the unchanging 
Because I want us to understand this. When God created him, way back at the beginning of time, when he spoke it into existence, God's thought, God's desire was this, that he would create for himself a world that is holy and pure, where he could come down and commune with mankind. Matter of fact, we know, we know scripture, for example, in the first part of Genesis, where it does say that he came down and he walked with Adam in the coolness of the day. However, there's been a hiccup, a bad one, called sin. I thought it very interesting as I was thinking about this that, you know, we time as we know it pretty much started at the sin of mankind. And we're going to see today that time will end as we know it with the man of sin. Really interesting, isn't it? Start with the sin of man, end with the man of sin. But in all of this, we're going to find that God did not, will really not, has not, nor will he ever change. God's desire was to have a people for himself, a world for himself, that is going to be in holiness, that is going to be in purity, that is going to be in righteousness, where he will reign. So many of us think that, well, you see, you know, Things have gotten like this and, and, and all of this, so God has changed a bit. He's changed his plans. He's not going to have a righteous, holy, sinless world. But he will. The book of the Revelation, if we were to go toward the end of the book of the Revelation, we will find that it says that he will create a new heaven and a new earth. And it will be holy. And it will be righteous. And it will be pure. And it will be where he will be able to come and to reign. And mankind will be pure, holy, and righteous. So God did not change. God is not going to change. God's mind and God's plan, though it may have been interrupted by Satan, interrupted by the fall of mankind, interrupted by throwing Lucifer out of heaven, casting him into hell, and therefore into the earth, and therefore giving man a will. So it's been interrupted. But may I submit to you this morning, it has not been changed. It's just an interruption. And one day, God will have the world as he had intended it to be. Give me Second Thessalonians 1, please, 7 through 10. And I'm going to look at three different things. And, you know, over the course of today. Because of who God is, and because he is unchanging, we do not need to be dismayed. We do not look at the uh, need to look at the news and listen to the news and see all this stuff that is going on around us and be dismayed. We do not. Why? God's in control. God's in control. God's in control. And Paul is going to allow us to see that. Then we're going to look at a second one where it says that we do not need to be deceived. And there's a couple of deceptions that we're going to see in this portion of Scripture. One was, well, okay, I'll do that. One was the deception that some people had gotten together and had, had penned a letter to the church at Thessalonica saying that the rapture had already occurred. And Paul says, that is not from my hand. I did not write that letter. You have been deceived. And Paul goes on and gives a wonderful exegesis as to how that deception happened and how he could prove that they had been deceived. There's a second deception that I really want all of us to understand at, towards the end of the service. 
this morning, but to me it's so important, I need to give it to you right now. I've had a lot of people say to me over the years that they don't need to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior today because they're going to wait until after Jesus comes <laughs> to prove that Jesus is truly God, then they're going to accept him. May I submit to you, when that day comes, they will not give a second chance to accept Christ as their personal Savior. They have gone through the age of grace and after Jesus Christ comes and takes his church away, that age of grace has then been, been uh, finished. And those who have lived during the age of grace and who, who have heard the message of the, of the great salvation plan which God has given, they will not be given another chance to accept that plan. I'm going to prove that this morning. The last part I'm going to be picking out this morning is this. We do not have to think that at the end of time we will be disappointed. We will not be disappointed at who the victor is and what is going to happen to the enemy. Now, all of us as human beings have this thing where, you know, well, I hope he gets his becomings, you know. Well, guess what? He's going to. And Paul lets us see that in these portions of Scripture that I'm going to be bringing out. Now we have this. Paul goes and says this in verse 7. Because now remember, the Thessalonian church has now been troubled because they thought that they had missed the rapture. Have any of you been taught that? Have you missed the rapture? Have I missed the rapture of the church? No. We have not. <coughs> Yet there was a letter written, signed by someone who signed the Apostle Paul's name to it, that the people were taking around, they were reading it, and thinking that it was from the great Apostle Paul. So Paul had to write them and say, that is not, that is a forgery. What is one of the greatest attributes of the enemy? Lies. Lies and deception. Forgery. When it talks about the anti-Christ. Anti meaning instead of. Or in place of. When the tribulation time comes, which we are not at yet, this Antichrist will be revealed. Now, he may be alive today, by the way. That's how I believe how close the coming of Jesus Christ truly is. But it won't be until after the rapture of the church that the Anti, the one who is going to come in place of the Christ, will be revealed, will be made known, will be manifested. So what Paul was writing to the church of Thessalonica, and, he, and he's really concerned about them, so he says to them, to you who are troubled. How many of us today, as we look at what's happening in our world, how many of us are troubled? Now, it's one thing to be troubled, it's another thing to be concerned. I'm very concerned about what's happening in the world today. But I can tell you this, I'm not troubled. Because I know, I know, I know who holds tomorrow. Do you? Paul says it is. Those of you who are troubled, I wish they could have commented. Why? Then he has a thought, that's for us. You don't have to be troubled. Watch us. Watch that we are resting in Christ. Rest with us. It's almost like you're taking the picture of us being like a child, going and being embraced by the Savior, and the Savior embracing us and holding us to his rest. And resting with him. 
Paul said, we do not need to be a people that is dismayed or a people that is discouraged or a people who are under a heavy hand because of all that is happening. Now, we need, need to be concerned about it. But we do not need to be troubled by it. So he goes and says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, one of the things that we find in this passage of Scripture in Thessalonians is that God combines both his coming for the church and his second coming to rule the world almost together. And, and you know, so it's hard sometimes to, to pick out or to see where the difference is. But this is what, where, where Paul is writing. Where, look, he's going to be revealed in heaven. So this is not talking about the rapture, by the way. This is talking about when he is revealed and all the world will see him. At the rapture, how many is going to see him? Yeah, how many are going to see him? Just the church. Just the church. Why? Because we're going to meet him in the air. We're going to meet him in the clouds. All right, so, so Paul puts together the two in, in, in synonymously, okay? So he does that. And he says, the Lord needs to be revealed from heaven with the mighty in flaming fire, taking vengeance, and so forth. Now, look at verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Who is that? It's you and me. To be glorified in his saints and to be admired. I love this. I love it. When we get to heaven, or when the rapture happens, so many of us say, when I, when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go look up my Aunt Matilda and make sure she's there. <laughs> that ain't going to be the first thing that's going to happen, folks. You know what the first thing that's going to be happening? We're going to admire him. We're going to fall at his feet and say, oh, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what we're going to be doing. And the sense here is, look, and he'll be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all of them that what? Believe. That believe. That's all believers. And he would be admired. He'd be, actually, the word is wondered at. Wondered at. Looking at who he is and and just seeing his, his great transforming power. <coughs> there would be a great transforming power at the rapture. You bet there is, because what's going to happen? All those bodies that are in the graves that are all decayed and nothing, guess what? They're going to be made beautiful, holy, perfect. And the soul and spirit and body will once again be put together again. And we will admire him for that and say, Whoa, look what he did! Yeah. How'd you do that, Lord? God. Well, I did it the same way I made Adam. <laughs> you know? But they're going to admire him for it. They're going to look at the transforming power, the, the wonderful mm -hmm. way in which he did it, and just said, There it is, he spoke it. Just like creation. He spoke and said, let there be. And there was. There's no hesitation. Let there be. And there was. He spoke. Yeah, I probably shouldn't go down this rabbit trail, but I'm going to. How many of us are concerned about the battle of Armageddon? That great war of wars. Where all the nations are going to gather together in this bowl called Megiddo. I've been there. The big bowl. And they're all going to be there. Satan and all of his forces are going to be there. God and his forces are going to be there. And we're all going to be on the forces. But none of us are going to have a sword. We won't need one. Right. Why? Jesus has got the sword. You know, and, and this is just my sense of humor. 
Jesus is just simply going to speak a word. Yeah. Satan dropped dead. And he's cast into the pits forever yeah. and ever. There won't be a sword raised. There won't be a shot fired. There won't be anything. All there will be is his voice. <coughs> Satan, go to hell. And he will act. To be chained forever and ever. That's, that's how wonderful God is, who he is. So Paul says to you, look, we do not, we, you know, you and I, we do not have to be dismayed. We do not have to be troubled. I like what Phil always says. I'm at the end of the book, and guess what? Yeah, yeah. We win. <laughs> we win. You do not have to be dismayed. So they're going to be, you know, they're going to look at him and they're going to admire him. They're going to be in wonder of his great transforming power. They're going to be in great wonder of his saving grace. Let me ask you a question. When you get to heaven, do you think when you get to heaven, when I get to heaven, and we're looking around, there's going to be people that you and I never thought would have a chance in any place to get there. And you know something? We're going to be there. They're probably saying the same about me, too. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I have a lot of people who would look at and say, Harold Noyes, are you kidding me? But you know what it's also scary though? There's going to be some who you and I expect to be there and we're not going to see. That's scary, isn't it? But they're going to wonder, they're going to admire him for his amazing grace that he bestowed upon each and every one of us. So they're going to admire him for his transforming power. They're going to admire him for his saving grace. They're going to admire him for his amazing power. <clears throat> Look at what he just did. So you and I do not have to be dismayed. We do not. Let's go down a little further. We find the who. Okay. We have the we have the who that are going to become or have the verse 8 obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the who. And then you have, the who shall be punished. I'll, I'll be back to that later. And then when he comes, we glorify the saints. It's, 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 this is Christ Jesus. You know, and, and then you have the when. You see, when he shall come. What does that mean? It's going to happen. Right? Guess what? There's no question this is going to happen. Because Paul goes and says to us, when? It doesn't say possibly or maybe. Well, there's a chance of. No. When he shall come. Guess what? That's fixed. He will come. So you've got the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will come. There's no question that he's going to come. And then you have the wonder of his coming, but then you also have the testimony of his coming. We've got that in verse 10. To be admired in all them that believe because of what? Do you, you see that little three little word? Our. What does that mean to you and me? We better open our mouth and let the Spirit go through us. Do we have a testimony mm -hmm. to the world around us? Jesus Christ left you and I here to be a testimony for Him. If we had nothing to do, and if there was no purpose of you and I being here, the moment we had trusted Christ as Savior, we would have gone to heaven. But God says, you know something I'm going to drop you to do now. I want you to be a testimony for me. You are the light of the world. We're not only light, we are the salt. Right? Well, the salt of the world, too. I mean, it may have a little stinging effect on some people, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> a little trancing effect. By the way, it's really, really interesting because as I, as I was looking through all of this and, and thinking about all of this, you know, the next section that I'm going to look at right now is this. 
there are two restrainers right now in the world. Give me a second, Thessalonians 2. We'll go there. Actually, I should give you Malachi 4 2 first. But anyway. Watch this. There are two restrainers. We think things have gotten bad. And we certainly think that things are going to get worse, aren't they? Let me ask a question. What would happen? Would there be any difference in our world today if the church was not present? It would be. So let me ask you this. If you think that there would be a big difference if the church was not visibly here now, what do you think the church is? We are one of the restrainers that God has left on the earth before all hell breaks loose. We think things are getting pretty bad, and I think that they are. However, do you know that the church is doing the work of a, as a restrainer through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So therefore, we are not to be deceived. Even though we may look and say, well, we really don't seem to be having the effect that we ought to be having. Guess what? Don't be deceived. We are still having an effect. There are still things. And by the way, on my computer, I get these, I get these notices and almost every week, if not almost every day of the week, I get these notices of wonderful things that are happening here in New England. Maybe not right here in our own little area right now, but there are some wonderful things happening in churches. Every single week I give reports of churches that are baptizing many, many people. Many people are coming to a saving knowledge of Christ right here in New England. So the church is doing a work. But let's look at this. We go down here in verse, uh, give me verses 7 to 12. If you don't mind, 4, 4. For the mystery of iniquity, I love the word. He goes and says the mystery of iniquity. Well, yeah. How is it getting like this? I mean, iniquity, sin, and, and, and things that are, are not good. And the mystery of iniquity does already work. Are we seeing any of that? If we're not, we've got to write badly closed, right? We don't have to be a genius to know that the mystery of iniquity is working today. So the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who let now let uh, now will let until he be taken out of the way. Give me verse, go back up to verse 6 just for a second. Watch this. And now you know what was told of, okay? So you had that word what in verse 6, and you get the word he in verse 7. The word what is talking about the church. The word he is talking about the Holy Spirit of God. Now what is going to happen at the rapture? At the taking out of the church? When you and I leave this place bodily in the twinkling of an eye, and they meet the Lord in the air. The church and the Holy Spirit go up together. We are the two restrainers God has left on earth. But guess what? Time will come, and I think very soon, when those two restrainers are going to be out of here. And when those two restrainers are out of here, all hell's going to break loose. Nothing will be off the table. Nothing will be left to the imagination. Nothing. Because Satan will have full reign. Now, this is only going to be for seven years. But he'll have full reign. Because you don't have the testimony of the church, and you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit of God working through the church to do the job that is needed to do. So we as a church need not be deceived. And we had best not be deceived. Best not. But there is a deception. 
Look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of judgment, or the son of perdition. What's going to happen? May I ask you, how grounded are you in your faith? And the reason I ask that is because during this time, there's going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away. And we must make sure that each of us examine ourselves in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it will be a great apostasy. Just read the book of Jude. And you will find that happening. Paul makes reference to that. And then be revealed in the son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself about all that is called God. Why? He's going to go and he's going to set up a kingdom. And he's going to sit on the throne. And he's going to call himself God for those seven years. And everybody's going to flock to worship him. He'll do some miracles that will convince some of the church. Too. Sure. Well, some of you, yeah. Those, you know, yet there's a lot of people who will say to us, well, you know, I'm going to wait until Jesus comes back and then I'll make a decision to follow him. You will not. You won't. The scripture tells us that God will present them strong delusions. Some people will say, yeah, but I'll never follow Satan. I'll never follow his word. But I tell you what, you will. Because you will be so deluded, you will not see the truth. You cannot wait till after the rapture to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You cannot. You had better not. Because if you do, you're going to be lost and go to hell. Man, I can't tell you any straighter than that. But that's what will happen. We have that. Except they come a falling away from us, and that man will be revealed, who opposes and so forth. Remember you not. Go back, go up to verse 7, please, for me. For the mystery of iniquity that has come, then shall the wicked be revealed, when, after the rapture, the wicked will be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume. Ah, wait a minute. I don't have to be dismayed. I don't have to be cons cons uh, disturbed. And I don't have to be discouraged. Why? Because what is God going to do? He's going to consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. One day he's going to come down after the tribulation period and say, guess what, son? You're done. Mm -hmm. You're going to go straight to hell. Well, you'll be chained forever. In ever and ever in everlasting darkness. We don't have to be discouraged. We win if you know Christ as your personal Savior. But man, we had best not wait until later. Go down to verse 10. And with the deceivableness of our righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not. Receive not when? Before the rapture. Okay? Before the coming of Christ. They receive not the love of the truth that they may be saved. So after that time, they will not be saved because they will not listen, they will not adhere to what God had said, and they're going to, they're going to believe that strong delusion that the enemy is going to give, and they will never turn to Christ. What? What will God do? Look at verse 11. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusions, and they should believe in lie. Tell you what, the time of salvation is now. Behold, the day is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Tell you what, you are not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. However, we do not have to be dismayed. We do not have to be deceived. And we do not have to be disappointed. It's really interesting. When Jesus comes, he's going to come in two phases. The first phase he comes, he's going to come secretly for the church. 
Now, what do I mean by that? Yes, as a church, there'll be a, a day, the trumpet of God will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. The world will not see that. All they're going to see is, hey, have you seen heaven always lately? I've seen clothes on the floor. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, he left the dirty clothes on the floor. <coughs> Daddy says that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Daddy says that's normal. You know, but anyway, you know. But have you seen it? What happened to him? Of course, the, my thought is this. Of course, the government is going to say, well, the aliens came down and got him. <laughs> I tell you what, no aliens are going to come down and get Harold Lloyd, but Jesus Christ is. And he's going to come down and get me. And I'm going to meet him in the air. And then I will forever be with him. And then there will be a seven year period. Three and a half years of what seemingly is peace. Three and a half years of what seemingly is is things were okay, but then after that three and a half years, you got another three and a half years. And I tell you what, you don't want to be here. Because it's going to be horrible. Horrible. And then Jesus will come back. This time, not to meet the people in the air, but this time now, to set foot in Jerusalem. And he will reign. And he will be seated on the throne in the temple. And he'll be the king. And you know what? If you know Christ is your personal savior, you know who you're going to be? Right, right down here with him. Yeah. Reigning with him. If you think eternity is going to be boring, you don't know eternity. Yeah. <laughs> eternity is going to be anything but boring. Why? Because we're going to be serving him. You know? I can't wait. I can't wait to be caught up and admire him for all that he is and all that he's done. And I can't wait for that time that he had wanted so long ago to head for the earth and the people that he could call his own and he could be with them forever in, in purity and righteousness. And one day that is going to happen. So many of us say, I can't wait to get to heaven. And certainly I can't wait to get to heaven, but you know something? That's not where I'm going to spend eternity. I'm going to spend eternity down here when he creates that new heaven and that new earth in perfection. Wow. Has my God changed? Has my God plan changed from the before the beginning of the world? No! Has he had to maybe kind of rewrite some of the ways in which he's going to do it? No! It's going to happen. Just as he said. Mankind can't change his plans. Humanity cannot change what God has spoken. Do you know God like that? Do you know a God whose plans cannot be thwarted or changed? Or I like that beautiful scripture verse of Psalms that says his arms cannot be shortened. Wow. Can you give me that Malachi 4-2? I think it is. We won't need any heat pumps in. I we won't need any heat pumps in. And that is the well, and I love this. I love that. For unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, now, why does Malachi use the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness, and not the Son, S-O-N, of righteousness? Pray right sister. Huh? Pray right sister. Yeah. But let, let me give Wally as, a, as an example. <laughs> because, yeah, we love picking on Wally. Wally is up in his tree stand. Of course, Wally is one of these guys. He gets up at midnight, gets into his tree stand, waiting for that, that deer to come. However, there's a problem. You may hear rustling 
And you may hear the rubbing of antlers against trees, and you may hear the pouring of the, of the ground, but you can't see them. Why? The sun has not come up yet. So what do you think Wally is doing when he's seated there in his tree stand? What do you think he's praying? God, I sure wish you would bring that sun up today. <laughs> Can't you bring it up a few minutes early? Because I, I gotta see that deer. And guess what? It ain't gonna happen. The sun will come up when the sun comes up. We can not change it. And the sun will go down when the sun goes down. We can not change it. So what is Malachi saying to you and me? When he talks about the sun of righteousness and rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of a star. He says, guess what? You can't change a thing. You do not have the authority. But I do. I do. And you know something, folks? God's plan will be perfectly, perfectly, perfectly executed. Perfectly. So therefore, when Paul says to us, do not be troubled. Give me Second Thessalonians one again, please. So the verses, and then now I can just go over the two. I just want to see this again. Watch it. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, gather together. Um, you should not be soon shaken in mind. Verse two: You are to be troubled, neither by spirit or word or by letter, as from us as a death. Don't be shaken. Do not. Give me chapter 1, please. Second Thessalonians. Just so you see this. You who are what? Trouble. What was on Paul's heart? Don't be troubled. Why? Who is in charge? Jesus is. Will he change? No. His plan will be executed to the letter. Executed. Perfectly. In his in history. So let's not be shaken. Let's not be troubled. Let's not be deceived. Let us not be discouraged. We win. If you know Christ is your personal Savior. But if you are one of these who are waiting for Jesus to come back and then make a decision, you had best make a decision today. Today is the day of salvation. Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. If Jesus comes back, you will not make that decision. Because you'll set strong delusions and you will believe a lie. Come to Jesus, please. Please. I can't beg anybody with any more plea. Come know Jesus today in his fullness. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, help us not to be a people who are dismayed with all that is happening and all that is taking place in our world. Lord, help us to rest in you. Help us not to be deceived. Lord, not that the enemy would just be able to deceive us or our loved ones or friends or government or whatever. Lord God, just help us not to be, help us to know the truth and to rest in the truth and to walk in the truth and to live by the truth. So Father, help us not to be deceived. And those who are, who are thinking that they can accept Christ later and, and do it then, Father, it's a great life in the pits of hell. Lord, convict their hearts now, whether here in this auditorium or all over the world that will be watching. Touch hearts today. Today is a day of salvation. And Father, help us never be discouraged. Because by one word of your mouth, Satan will be totally decimated and thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. So, Father, we win. Lord, thank you for that. 
So Lord, touch every heart. Be with each of us. And we'll thank you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by